of a nervous wreck figuring out what I was going to say this morning. But as the week passed, things came together a lot easier than I had expected, which I didn't really understand until last night when I was going over remarks as to what I was going to say this morning. I realized that I didn't write this to present to you this morning. God wrote this for me. And knowing me as he does and how stubborn I can be, he thought maybe I would listen better if I preached it myself. So this morning, I would just like for you to take a walk with me. I want to show you something. We're going to go back in time to an event that happened hundreds, actually thousands of years ago. But history is repeating itself right here, right now. And I think maybe together we can learn something. Where we're going is a little scary. But then where and when we're living right now is a little scary, isn't it? COVID, violence, wars, hatred. But we're going to go to the Valley of Elah, and the first place we enter is a beautiful green valley. We see a stream running through here, and the first thing that catches our attention is a slender young man. He's kneeling by the stream, and he seems to be searching for stones, smooth stones, something like this, ones that pack easily into a shepherd's pack. Flat rocks that balance heavy on the palm and missile with comet crashing force into the head of a wolf or a lion that's threatening his flock, or in the case of today, a giant. As we watch this young man, we hear a thud and the ground shakes and causes us to look up and up and up. On the far side of a valley stands a giant of a man. He's almost 10 feet tall. He's wearing 125 pounds of armor. His biceps burst, his thigh muscles ripple, and he's snarling like the main contender at a WWF championship night. His voice rumbles through the valley. This day I defy the God of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. We all know this story. It's found in 1 Samuel 17. Trish told it for us this morning, and um, Mark's songs tied in perfectly with what I'm saying this morning. Even though we never spoke, God is, is very good. This is perhaps the greatest underdog story of all time. What chance did this young man have? David probably weighed less than Goliath's army armor. <laughs> he was used to tending sheep not fighting monsters. What were his odds against this giant? Honestly, I think maybe better odds than leave the Valley of Elah for a moment and come back here to Orange. As you sit in the pew this morning, are you facing your own giant? I know I am. Your Goliath may not carry a sword or a shield. He may brandish the blade of unemployment, depression, divorce, or disease. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of Elah. He prances through your office, through your thoughts, your dreams, your bedroom. He brings you bills you can't pay, people you can't please, a career you can't escape, a past you just can't shake, a temptation you cannot overcome, and a future you just can't face. Yet face that future we must. And often, the larger the giants we face, the greater men, the men and women we become. For instance, take the giant of disability. Cripple a man, and you have a Sir Walter Scott or a Stephen Hawking. Lock him in a prison cell, and you have an Apostle Paul or a Nelson Mandela. Bury him in the snows of Valley Forge, and you might have a George Washington, or raise him in abject poverty, and you have an Abraham Lincoln. Burn him so severely that the doctors say he will never walk again. And you have a Glenn Cunningham, who set the world's, world's one-mile record in 1934. Have him or her born black in a society filled with hatred and racial discrimination and you have a Booker T. Washington, a George Washington Carver, or a Martin Luther King Jr. 
Call him a slow learner. Tell him he's retarded. Tell him his parents that he is completely uneducatable. And you will have an Albert Einstein. Conquerors all. They face their giants and have gone down in history as victors. We need David's story this morning. I need David's story. Giants lurk in our neighborhoods. Rejection, failure, revenge, remorse. Our struggles sometimes breed like a prize fighter's itinerary. In the main event, we have Joe the Christian facing off against the drinkers and smokers and partiers that he works with every day of his life. Weighing in at 120 pounds, Elizabeth, the lonely checkout girl, will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the jerks who take and break her heart. Or in this corner, we have the strained marriage of Jason and Monica. And in the opposing corner, the huge challenger from the state of confusion, that homebreaker called distrust. Giants, we must face them. The good news is, we don't have to face them alone. There is one beside us who longs to fight with us, to take up the battle with us. Focus first and foremost on God. The times David did, giants fell. The days he didn't, David fell. What is your giant's name? It probably isn't Goliath. I know my giant's name well. Maybe yours is depression, indebtedness, divorce, disease, but it strikes fear into your heart just as Goliath terrorized the Israelites. How long has your giant stalked you? Goliath's family was an ancient foe of the Israelites. Joshua drove them out of the promised land 300 years ago. Saul's soldiers saw Goliath and fumbled, not again. My dad fought his dad. My granddad fought his granddad. And you've probably grown to similar words. I'm becoming a workaholic, just like my father. History is repeating itself. Depression just runs in our family. I can't help it. Cancer cannot be hitting us again. When Saul and his men heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified. Are you terrified today? Please forgive me, I woke up with a sore throat this morning, so. Are you terrified today? Maybe it's because your focus is wrong. You see your giant, but is he all you see? You know his voice, it's deafening. But is that all you hear? David saw and heard more. Oh, he saw Goliath. He couldn't miss him. But David's first comment, though it mentions Goliath, was about his God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he defies the armies of the living God? David shows up discussing God. The soldiers mentioned nothing about him. The brothers never spoke his name. But David takes one step on the stage and raises the subject of his living God. And he does the same with King Saul, remember? The, no chit-chat about the battle or questions about the odds. He just made an announcement. The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the mouth of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. No one else discusses God. David discusses no one else but God. David sees what others don't and refuses to see what others do. To him, this is not David versus Goliath. To him, this is my God versus some giant. All eyes except David's fall on this brutal, hate-breathing hulk, and all journals except David's describe day after day after day in the land of the Neanderthal. They have watched, listened analyzed and been terrorized by this monster. They've majored in Goliath. God, David majored, majored in God. He sees the giant, mind you. He just sees God more. When you have a minute, read 1 Samuel 17 and list the observations David made about Goliath. 
I was only able to find two. One statement to Saul about Goliath in verse 26, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And one to Goliath's face when he said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel that you have defiled. That's it. Two Goliath comments. No inquiries about Goliath's size or skill or age or power or social standing or IQ. David asks nothing about the weight of the spear, the size of the shield, or the meaning of that big skull and crossbones on Goliath's bicep. David gives no thought to the Leviathan on the, th on the hill, none, but he gives much thought to God. Now read David's words again, this time underlining his references to his Lord. Verse 26, the armies of the living God. Verse 45, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Verse 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hand that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. God thoughts, God thoughts outnumber Goliath thoughts nine to two. How does this ratio compare with yours? with mine. Do you ponder God's grace four times as much as you ponder your problems? Is your list of blessings four times as long as your list of complaints? Hmm. Is your mental file of hope four times as thick as your mental file of dread? Are you four times as likely to describe the strength of your God as you are the trials of your day? David sees the armies of God, and because he does, David hurries and runs toward the army to meet the Philistine. David's brothers cover their eyes, both in fear and embarrassment. Saul sighs as this young Hebrew races to certain death. When was the last time you ran toward your giant? We tend to retreat duck behind a desk of work or crawl into a glass of distraction and for a moment or a day or a year we feel safe, insulated, protected, but then the work runs out or the booze wears off or the friends leave and we hear Goliath again, booming, bombastic, deafening. Try a different tack. Rush your giant with a God-saturated soul. Amplify God. Minimize Goliath. Giant of divorce, you are not entering my home. Monster of depression, you will not defeat me. Goliath of alcohol, child abuse, loneliness, you are going down. How long since you loaded your sling and took a swing at your giant? Did you ever wonder why David picked up five stones? I did for a long time. Could it be because Goliath had four relatives the size of Tyrannosaurus Rex? The Bible tells us he did. And for all David knew, all four of them were going to come running over the hill to defend their kin. David was ready to empty the chamber if that's what it took. Goliaths still roam our world. COVID, cancer, hatred, violence, war, supersized challenges still swagger and strut and steal our sleep and siphon our joy. So this morning, I would like to suggest that we do what David did. Face your giants by facing God first. Focus on giants, you will stumble. Focus on God, your giants will tumble. We serve the same God David served, don't we? So I'd like to recommend we take up five stones, David did, and quickly we'll use our five fingers to remind us of the stones that we can use to fell our Goliath. Let your thumb remind you of the past. No, 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 hear me out here, not your past. Don't go there. Don't do that. I'm talking about the stone of God's past. While everyone else quivered, David remembered. 
God had given him strength to wrestle a lion and strong arm a bear. Wouldn't he do the same with a giant? David said to Saul, I have killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be one of them, seeing he has defiled the enemies of the living God. David remembered what God had done for him. A good memory makes heroes. A bad memory makes wimps. First Chronicles 16.12 tells us, remember his marvelous works, which he has done. Catalog God's successes. Keep a list of his world records. Hasn't he walked you through floodwaters? Hasn't he proven always faithful? He has made roadkill of your enemies. Write today's worries in sand, but chisel yesterday's victories in stone. Remember, pick up the stone of the past. Then pick up the stone of prayer. Note the valley between your thumb and your forefinger. To pass from one to the next, you have to go through the valley. Let it remind you of David's valley. Before going high, David went low. Before ascending to fight Goliath, David bowed low in prayer. Don't face your giant without first doing the same. Dedicate time to prayer. When David soaked his mind in God, he stood. When he didn't, he flopped. Do you think he spent much time in prayer the day he seduced Bathsheba? You think he wrote a psalm the day he murdered Uriah? Doubtful. But we know he prayed before he faced Goliath. And we have 150 psalms of his heart-rending prayers throughout his lifetime. Mark well this promise. God will keep in perfect peace all who trust in him, whose thoughts are fixed on him. God promises not just peace, but perfect peace, undiluted, unspotted, unhindered peace. To whom? To those whose minds are fixed on God. He didn't say f occasional glances, occasional wishes, dismiss random ponderings. Peace is promised to the one who fixes their thoughts and desires on God. Pray long and hard and constantly. Invite God's help. Pick up the stone of prayer. And now let your tallest finger remind you of your highest priority, God's reputation. David jealously guarded it. Your third stone should be the stone of priority. No one was going to defame David's Lord. In verses 46 and 47, David said he would fight so that the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. I think David saw Goliath as a chance for God to show off. And did David know that he would exit that battle alive? No, he didn't but he was willing to give his life for the reputation of his God. What if we saw our giant the same way? Rather than begrudge him, welcome him. Come on, face him head on. Your cancer is God's chance to flex his healing muscles. Your sin is God's opportunity to showcase his amazing grace. Your struggling marriage can billboard God's power. See your struggle as God's canvas. On it, he will paint his multicolored supremacy. Shout God's name and then reach for the stone of passion. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran which way? To meet him. He didn't run from him. He ran toward his giant. On one side of the battlefield, Saul and his cowardly army quivered, and on the other, Goliath and his skulls, skull splitters scoffed. And in the middle, the shepherd boy ran as fast as he could on his spindly legs. Who bet on David? Who put money on the kid from Bethlehem? Not the Philistines, not the Hebrews, certainly not David's siblings or even David's king, but God did. 
And since God did, and since David knew God did, the skinny kid became a blur of pumping knees and a swirling sling. He ran toward his giant. Goliath actually threw back his head to laugh at him, just enough to shift his helmet and expose a square inch of forehead flesh. And David spotted the target, seized the moment the stone torpedoed into the giant's skull. Goliath's eyes crossed and his legs buckled as he crumbled to the ground and died. How long since you ran toward your giant? What good has problem pondering gotten you? You and I have stared so long at our giant that we can number the hairs on Goliath's chest. Has it helped? No. Listing hurts won't heal them. Itemizing problems, thinking about them, dwelling on them, it doesn't solve them. David lobotomized the giant because he emphasized the Lord. So pick up the stone of passion. And last, but certainly not least, pick up the stone of persistence. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 tells us to pray without ceasing. One prayer might not be enough. One apology might not do it. One day or one month of firm resolve just might not get it. You may get knocked down a time or two or three or six, but don't quit. Keep loading the rocks. Keep swinging the sling. Be persistent. David took five stones and ran toward the giant. He made five decisions. The past remembering how God had led him all his life. Prayer, asking God's help and then turning it over to him. Priority, he made God first. God's reputation was most important. He was passionate and persistent. Next time your giant roars, reach for a stone. Odds are he'll be out of the room before you can load your sling. One word from you, any word, and God will do again what he did with David. He will slay your giant, claim you, save you, and use you. Any word will do, but maybe something like this might work. Jesus, I trust you with my life. I want to make you first as my master, savior, and giant killer. I trust you with all my heart and I give you my life totally and completely. Pray these words with an honest heart and be assured of this. Your greatest Goliath has already fallen. Your failures are flushed and your demons destroyed. The power that conquered David's giant has done the same with yours. Focus on your giant, you will stumble. Focus on God your giant will tumble. Lift up your eyes, giant slayer. The God who made a miracle out of David stands ready to make one out of you. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this wonderful story of David. We so need it today in this scary, frightening world where so many people are possessed by fear, overcome by the giants that surround us. And yet, dear Lord, you are here by our side, ready to fight the battle with us, and we will conquer with your help. Thank you, dear Lord, for slaying our giants. In thy name, amen.